Chapter 6 Down the sloping lawn below me the male students moved toward their dormitories, seeming far away from me now, remote, and each shadowy form vastly superior to me, who had by some shortcoming cast myself into the darkness away from all that was worthwhile and inspiring. I listened to one group harmonize quietly as they passed. The smell of fresh bread being prepared in the bakery drifted to me. The good white bread of breakfast, the rolls dripping with yellow butter that I had slipped into my pocket so often to be munched later in my room with wild blackberry jam from home. Lights began to appear in the girls' dormitories, like the bursting of luminous seeds flung broadside by an invisible hand. Several cars rolled by. I saw a group of old women who lived in the town approaching. One used a cane which from time to time she tapped hollowly upon the walk like a blind man. Snatches of their conversation fluttered to me as they discussed Barbie's talk with enthusiasm, recalled the times of the founder, their quavering voices weaving and embroidering his story. Then down the long avenue of trees I saw the familiar Cadillac approaching and started inside the building, suddenly filled with panic. I hadn't gone two steps before I turned and hurried out into the night again. I couldn't stand to face Dr. Bled so immediately. I was fairly shivering as I fell in behind a group of boys going up the drive. They were arguing some point heatedly, but I was too agitated to listen and simply followed in their shadows, noticing the dull gleam of their polished shoe leather in the rays of the street lamps. I kept trying to formulate what I would say to Dr. Bled so and the boys must have turned into their building, for suddenly finding myself outside the gates of the campus and heading down the highway, I turned and ran back to the building. When I went in he was wiping his neck with a blue bordered handkerchief. The shaded lamp catching the lenses of his glasses left half of his broad face in shadow as his clenched fists stretched full forth in the light before him. I stood, hesitating in the door. Aware suddenly of the old heavy furnishings, the relics from the times of the founder, the framed portrait photographs and relief plaques of presidents and industrialists, men of power fixed like trophies or heraldic emblems upon the walls. Come in, he said from the half shadow, then I saw him move and his head coming forward, his eyes burning. He began mildly, as if quietly joking, throwing me off balance. Boy, he said. I understand that you not only carried Mr. Norton out to the quarters but that you wound up at that sinkhole, that golden day. It was a statement, not a question. I said nothing and he looked at me with the same mild gaze. Had Barbie helped Mr. Norton soften him? No, he said, it wasn't enough to take him to the quarters, you had to make the complete tour, to give him the full treatment. Was that it? No, sir. I mean that he was ill. Sir, I said. He had to have some whiskey. And that was the only place you knew to go, he said. So you went there because you were taking care of him? Yes, sir. And not only that, he said in a voice that both mocked and marveled, you took him out and sat him down on the gallery, veranda, piazza, whatever they call it nowadays, and introduced him to the quality. Quality? I frowned. Oh, but he insisted that I stop sir. There was nothing I could do. Of course, he said. Of course. He was interested in the cabins, sir. He was surprised that there were any left. So naturally you stopped, he said, bowing his head again. Yes, sir. Yes, and I suppose the cabin opened up and told him its life history and all the choice gossip. I started to explain. Boy. He exploded. Are you serious? Why were you out on that road in the first place? Weren't you behind the wheel? Yes, sir. Then haven't we bowed and scraped and begged and lied enough decent homes and drives for you to show him? Did you think that white man had to come a thousand miles, all the way from New York and Boston and Philadelphia just for you to show him a slum? Don't just stand there, say something. But I was only driving him, sir. I only stopped there after he ordered me to. Ordered you? He said. He ordered you. Damn it, white folk are always giving orders, it's a habit with them. Why didn't you make an excuse? Couldn't you say they had sickness, smallpox, 
or picked another cabin? Why that true blood shack? My God, boy! You're black and living in the South, did you forget how to lie? Lie, sir? Lie to him, lie to a trustee, sir? Me? He shook his head with a kind of anguish. And me thinking I'd picked a boy with brain, he said. Didn't you know you were endangering the school? But I was only trying to please him. Please him? And here you are a junior in college. Why, the dumbest black bastard in the cotton patch knows that the only way to please a white man is to tell him a lie. What kind of education are you getting around here? Who really told you to take him out there? He said. He did, sir. No one else. Don't lie to me. That's the truth, sir. I warn you now, who suggested it? I swear, sir. No one told me. Nigger, this isn't the time to lie. I'm no white man. Tell me the truth. It was as though he'd struck me. I stared across the desk thinking, he called me that. Answer me, boy. That, I thought, noticing the throbbing of a vein that rose between his eyes, thinking, he called me that. I wouldn't lie, sir, I said. Then who was that patient you were talking with? I never saw him before, sir. What was he saying? I can't recall it all, I muttered. The man was raving. Speak up. What did he say? He thinks that he lived in France and that he's a great doctor. Continue. He say that I believed that White was right, I said. What? Suddenly his face twitched and cracked like the surface of dark water. And you do, don't you? Dr. Bledsoe said, suppressing a nasty laugh. Well, don't you? I did not answer, thinking, you, you. Who was he? Did you ever see him before? No, sir, I hadn't. Was he northern or southern? I don't know, sir. He struck his desk. College for Negroes. Boy, what do you know other than how to ruin an institution in half an hour that it took over half a hundred years to build? Did he talk northern or southern? He talked like a white man, I said, except that his voice sounded southern, like one of ours. I'll have to investigate him he said. A negro like that should be under lock and key. Across the campus a clock struck the quarter hour and something inside me seemed to muffle its sound. I turned to him desperately. Dr. Bledsoe, I'm awfully sorry. I had no intention of going there but things just got out of hand. Mr. Norton understands how it happened. Listen to me, boy, he said loudly. Norton is one man and I'm another. And while he might think he's satisfied, I know that he isn't. Your poor judgment has caused this school incalculable damage. Instead of uplifting the race, you've torn it down. He looked at me as though I had committed the worst crime imaginable. Don't you know we can't tolerate such a thing? I gave you an opportunity to serve one of our best white friends, a man who could make your fortune. But in return you dragged the entire race into the slime. Suddenly he reached for something beneath a pile of papers, an old leg shackle from slavery which he proudly called a symbol of our progress. You've got to be disciplined, boy, he said. There's no ifs and ands about it. But you gave Mr. Norton your word. Don't stand there and tell me what I already know. Regardless of what I said, as the leader of this institution I can't possibly let this pass. Boy, I'm getting rid of you. It must have happened when the metal struck the desk, for suddenly I was leaning toward him, shouting without rage. I'll tell him, I said. I'll go to Mr. Norton and tell him. You've lied to both of us. What? He said. You have the nerve to threaten me. In my own office? I'll tell him, I screamed. I'll tell everybody. I'll fight you. I swear it, I'll fight. Well, he said, sitting back, well. I'll be damned. For a moment he looked me up and down and I saw his head go back into the shadow, hearing a high, thin sound like a cry of rage, then his face came forward and I saw his laughter. For an instant I stared, then I wheeled and started for the door, hearing him sputter, wait, wait, behind me. I turned. He gasped for breath, propping his huge head up with his hands as tears streamed down his face. Come on, come, he said, removing his glasses and wiping his eyes. 
Come on, son, his voice amused and conciliatory. It was as though I were being put through a fraternity initiation and found myself going back. He looked at me, still laughing with agony. My eyes burned. Boy, you are a fool, he said. Your white folk didn't teach you anything and your mother wit has left you cold. What has happened to you young Negroes? I thought you had caught on to how things are done down here. But you don't even know the difference between the way things are and the way they're supposed to be. My God, he gasped, what is the race coming to? Why, boy, you can tell anyone you like, sit down there. Sit down, sir, I say. Reluctantly I sat, torn between anger and fascination, hating myself for obeying. Tell anyone you like, he said. I don't care. I wouldn't raise my little finger to stop you. Because I don't owe anyone a thing, son. Who, Negroes? Negroes don't control this school or much of anything else, haven't you learned even that? No, sir, they don't control this school, nor white folk either. True they support it, but I control it. Eyes big and black and I say yes, sue as loudly as any burr head when it's convenient, but I'm still the king down here. I don't care how much it appears otherwise. Power doesn't have to show off. Power is confident, self-assuring. Self-starting and self-stopping, self-warming and self-justifying. When you have it, you know it. Let the Negroes snicker and the crackers laugh. Those are the facts, son. The only ones I even pretend to please are big white folk, and even those I control more than they control me. This is a power setup, son, and I'm at the controls. You think about that. When you buck against me, you're bucking against power. Rich white folks' power, the nation's power, which means government power. He paused to let it sink in and I waited, feeling a numb, violent outrage. And I'll tell you something your sociology teachers are afraid to tell you, he said. If there weren't men like me running schools like this, there'd be no South. Nor North, either. No, and there'd be no country, not as it is today. You think about that, son. He laughed. With all your speech-making and studying I thought you understood something. But you. All right, go ahead. See Norton. You'll find that he wants you disciplined, he might not know it, but he does. Because he knows that I know what is best for his interests. You're a black-educated fool, son. These white folk have newspapers, magazines, radios, spokesmen to get their ideas across. If they want to tell the world a lie, they can tell it so well that it becomes the truth, and if I tell them that you're lying, they'll tell the world even if you prove you're telling the truth. Because it's the kind of lie they want to hear. I heard the high thin laugh again. You're nobody, son. You don't exist, can't you see that? The white folk tell everybody what to think, except men like me. I tell them, that's my life, telling white folk how to think about the things I know about. Shocks you doesn't it? Well, that's the way it is. It's a nasty deal and I don't always like it myself. But you listen to me, I didn't make it, and I know that I can't change it. But I've made my place in it and I'll have every Negro in the country hanging on tree limbs by morning if it means staying where I am. He was looking me in the eye now, his voice charged and sincere, as though uttering a confession. A fantastic revelation which I could neither believe nor deny. Cold drops of sweat moved at a glacier's pace down my spine. I mean it, son, he said. I had to be strong and purposeful to get where I am. I had to wait and plan and lick around. Yes, I had to act the nigger. He said, adding another fiery, yes. I don't even insist that it was worth it, but now I'm here and I mean to stay, after you win the game. You take the prize and you keep it, protect it, there's nothing else to do. He shrugged. A man gets old winning his place, son. So you go ahead, go tell your story, match your truth against my truth, because what I've said is truth, the broader truth. Test it, try it out. When I started out I was a young fellow. But I no longer listened, nor saw more than the play of light upon the metallic discs of his glasses which now seemed to float within the disgusting sea of his words. Truth, truth, 
what was truth? Nobody I knew, not even my own mother, would believe me if I tried to tell them. Nor would I tomorrow, I thought, nor would I. I gazed helplessly at the grain of the desk, then passed his head to the case of loving cups behind his chair. Above the case a portrait of the founder looked noncommittally down. He, he. Bledsoe laughed. Your arms are too short to box with me, son. And I haven't had to really clip a young negro in years. No, he said getting up, they haven't been so cocky as they used to. This time I could barely move, my stomach was knotted and my kidneys ached. My legs were rubbery. For three years I had thought of myself as a man and here with a few words he'd made me as helpless as an infant. I pulled myself up. Wait, hold on a second, he said, looking at me like a man about to flip a coin. I like your spirit, son. You're a fighter, and I like that, you just lack judgment, though lack of judgment can ruin you. That's why I have to penalize you, son. I know how you feel, too. You don't want to go home to be humiliated, I understand that, because you have some vague notions about dignity. In spite of me, such notions seep in along with the Jim Crack teachers and northern trained idealists. Yes, and you have some white folk backing you and you don't want to face them because nothing is worse for a black man than to be humiliated by white folk. I know all about that too, Ole Doc's been buked and scorned and all of that. I don't just sing about it in chapel, I know about it. But you'll get over it, it's foolish and expensive and a lot of dead weight. You let the white folk worry about pride and dignity, you learn where you are and get yourself power, influence, contacts with powerful and influential people, then stay in the dark and use it. How long will I stand here and let him laugh at me, I thought, holding on to the back of the chair, how long? You're a nervy little fighter, son he said, and the race needs good, smart, disillusioned fighters. Therefore I'm going to give you a hand, maybe you'll feel that I'm giving you my left hand after I've struck you with my right, if you think I'm the kind of man who'd lead with his right, which I'm most certainly not. But that's all right too, take it or leave it. I want you to go to New York for the summer and save your pride, and your money. You go there and earn your next year's fees, understand? I nodded, unable to speak, whirling about furiously within myself, trying to deal with him, to fit what he was saying to what he had said. I'll give you letters to some of the school's friends to see that you get work, he said. But this time, use your judgment, keep your eyes open, get in the swing of things. Then, if you make good, perhaps. Well, perhaps. It's up to you. His voice stopped as he stood, tall and black and disguised huge. That's all, young man, he said, his tone abrupt, official. You have two days in which to close your affairs. Two days? Two days, he said. I went down the steps and up the walk in the dark, making it out of the building just before it bent me double beneath the wisteria that hung from the trees on rope-like vines. Almost a total disembowelment and when it paused I looked up through the trees arched high and cool above me to see a whirling, double-imaged moon. My eyes were out of focus. I started toward my room, covering one eye with my hand to avoid crashing into trees and lampposts projected into my path. I went on, tasting bile and thankful that it was night with no one to witness my condition. My stomach felt raw. From somewhere across the quiet of the campus the sound of an old guitar blues plucked from an out-of-tune piano drifted toward me like a lazy, shimmering wave, like the echoed whistle of a lonely train, and my head went over again, against a tree this time, and I could hear it splattering the flowering vines. When I could move, my head started to whirl in a circle. The day's events flowed past. True blood, Mr. Norton. Dr. Bledsoe and the Golden Day swept around my mind in a mad surreal whirl. I stood in the path holding my eye and trying to push back the day, but each time I floundered upon Dr. Bledsoe's decision. It still echoed in my mind and it was real and it was final. Whatever my responsibility was for what had occurred, I knew that I would pay for it, knew that I would be expelled, and the very idea stabbed my insides again. I stood there on the moonlit walk 
trying to think ahead to its effects, imagining the satisfaction of those who envied my success, the shame and disappointment of my parents. I would never live down my disgrace. My white friends would be disgusted and I recalled the fear that hung over all those who had no protection from powerful whites. How had I come to this? I had kept unswervingly to the path placed before me, had tried to be exactly what I was expected to be, had done exactly what I was expected to do, yet, instead of winning the expected reward, here I was stumbling along, holding on desperately to one of my eyes in order to keep from bursting out my brain against some familiar object swerved into my path by my distorted vision. And now to drive me wild I felt suddenly that my grandfather was hovering over me, grinning triumphantly out of the dark. I simply could not endure it. For, despite my anguish and anger, I knew of no other way of living, nor other forms of success available to such as me. I was so completely a part of that existence that in the end I had to make my peace. It was either that or admit that my grandfather had made sense. Which was impossible. For though I still believed myself innocent, I saw that the only alternative to permanently facing the world of true blood and the golden day was to accept the responsibility for what had happened. Somehow, I convinced myself, I had violated the code and thus would have to submit to punishment. Dr. Bledsoe is right, I told myself, he's right, the school and what it stands for have to be protected. There was no other way and no matter how much I suffered I would pay my debt as quickly as possible and return to building my career. Back in my room I counted my savings, some fifty dollars, and decided to get to New York as quickly as possible. If Dr. Bledsoe didn't change his mind about helping me get a job, it would be enough to pay my room and board at men's house, about which I had learned from fellows who lived there during their summer vacations. I would leave in the morning. So while my roommate grinned and mumbled unaware in his sleep I packed my bags. Next morning I was up before the bugle sounded and already on a bench in Dr. Bledsoe's outer office when he appeared. The jacket of his blue serge suit was open, revealing a heavy gold chain linked between his vest pockets as he moved toward me with a noiseless tread. He passed without seeming to see me. Then as he reached his office door he said, I haven't changed my mind about you, boy. And I don't intend to. Oh, I didn't come for that, sir, I said, seeing him turn quickly, looking down upon me, his eyes quizzical. Very well, as long as you understand that, come in and state your business. I have work to do. I waited before the desk, watching him place his Humberg on an old brass hall tree. Then he sat before me, making a cage of his fingers and nodding for me to begin. My eyes burned and my voice sounded unreal. I'd like to leave this morning, sir, I said. His eyes retreated. Why this morning? He said. I gave you until tomorrow. Why the hurry? It isn't hurry, sir. But since I have to leave I'd like to get going. Staying until tomorrow won't change matters. No, it won't, he said. That's good sense and you have my permission. And what else? That's all, sir, except that I want to say that I'm sorry for what I did and that I hold no hard feelings. What I did was unintentional, but I'm in agreement with my punishment. He touched his fingertips together, the thick fingers meeting delicately, his face without expression. That's the proper attitude, he said. In other words, you don't intend to become bitter, is that it? Yes, sir. Yes, I can see that you're beginning to learn. That's good. Two things our people must do is accept responsibility for their acts and avoid becoming bitter. His voice rose with the conviction of his chapel speeches. Son, if you don't become bitter, nothing can stop you from success. Remember that. I shall, sir, I said. Then my throat thickened and I hoped he would bring up the matter of a job himself. Instead, he looked at me impatiently and said, Well? I have work to do. My permission is granted. Well, sir, I'd like to ask a favor of you. Favor, he said shrewdly. Now that's another matter. What kind of favor? It isn't much, sir. You suggested that you would put me in touch with some of the trustees who would give me a job. I'm willing to do anything. Oh, 
Yes, he said, yes, of course. He seemed to think for a moment, his eyes studying the objects on his desk. Then touching the shackle gently with his index finger, he said, very well. When do you intend to leave? By the first bus, if possible, sir. Are you packed? Yes, sir. Very well. Go get your bags and return here in 30 minutes. My secretary will give you some letters addressed to several friends of the school. One of them will do something for you. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much, I said as he stood. That's all right, he said. The school tries to look out for its own. Only one thing more. These letters will be sealed, don't open them if you want help. White folk are strict about such things. The letters will introduce you and request them to help you with a job. I'll do my best for you and it isn't necessary for you to open them, understand? Oh, I wouldn't think of opening them, sir, I said. Very well, the young lady will have them for you when you return. What about your parents, have you informed them? No, sir, it might make them feel too bad if I told them I was expelled, so I plan to write them after I get there and get a job. I see. Perhaps that is best. Well, goodbye. Sir, I said, extending my hand. Goodbye, he said. His hand was large and strangely limp. He pressed a buzzer as I turned to leave. His secretary brushed past me as I went through the door. The letters were waiting when I returned, seven of them, addressed to men with impressive names. I looked for Mr. Norton's but his was not among them. Placing them carefully in my inside pocket, I grabbed my bags and hurried for the bus. Chapter 7 The station was empty, but the ticket window was open and a porter in a grey uniform was pushing a broom. I bought my ticket and climbed into the bus. There were only two passengers seated at the rear of the red and nickel interior, and I suddenly felt that I was dreaming. It was the vet, who gave me a smile of recognition, an attendant sat beside him. Welcome, young man, he called. Imagine, Mr. Crenshaw. He said to the attendant, we have a traveling companion. Morning, I said reluctantly. I looked around for a seat away from them, but although the bus was almost empty, only the rear was reserved for us and there was nothing to do but move back with them. I didn't like it, the vet was too much a part of an experience which I was already trying to blot out of my consciousness. His way of talking to Mr. Norton had been a foreshadowing of my misfortune just as I had sensed that it would be. Now having accepted my punishment, I wanted to remember nothing connected with True Blood or the Golden Day. Crenshaw, a much smaller man than Supercargo, said nothing. He was not the type usually sent out to accompany violent cases and I was glad until I remembered that the only violent thing about the vet was his tongue. His mouth had already gotten me into trouble and now I hoped he wouldn't turn it upon the white driver that was apt to get us killed. What was he doing on the bus anyway? God, how had Dr. Bledsoe worked that fast? I stared at the fat man. How did your friend Mr. Norton make out? He asked. He's okay, I said. No more fainting spells? No. Did he bawl you out for what happened? He didn't blame me, I said. Good. I think I shocked him more than anything else he saw at the Golden Day. I hoped I hadn't caused you trouble. School isn't out so soon, is it? Not quite, I said lightly. I'm leaving early in order to take a job. Wonderful. At home? No, I thought I might make more money in New York. New York? He said. That's not a place, it's a dream. When I was your age it was Chicago. Now all the little black boys run away to New York. Out of the fire into the melting pot. I can see you after you've lived in Harlem for three months. Your speech will change, you'll talk a lot about college, you'll attend lectures at the men's house. You might even meet a few white folks. And listen, he said, leaning close to whisper, you might even dance with a white girl. I'm going to New York to work, I said, looking around me. I won't have time for that. You will though, he teased. Deep down you're thinking about the freedom you've heard about up north, and you'll try it once, just to see if what you've heard is true. 
There's other kinds of freedom besides some Olay white trash women, Crenshaw said. He might want to see him some shows and eat in some of them big restaurants. The vet grinned. Why, of course, but remember, Crenshaw, he's only going to be there a few months. Most of the time he'll be working, and so much of his freedom will have to be symbolic. And what will be his or any man's most easily accessible symbol of freedom? Why, a woman, of course. In 20 minutes he can inflate that symbol with all the freedom which he'll be too busy working to enjoy the rest of the time. He'll see. I tried to change the subject. Where are you going? I asked. To Washington, D. C., he said. Then you're cured? Cured? There is no cure, he's being transferred, said Crenshaw. Yes, I'm headed for St. Elizabeth's, the vet said. The ways of authority are indeed mysterious. For a year I've tried to get transferred, then this morning I'm suddenly told to pack. I can't but wonder if our little conversation with your friend Mr. Norton had something to do with it. How could he have anything to do with it? I said, remembering Dr. Bledsoe's threat. How could he have anything to do with your being on this bus? He said. He winked. His eyes twinkled. All right, forget what I've said. But for God's sake, learn to look beneath the surface, he said. Come out of the fog, young man. And remember you don't have to be a complete fool in order to succeed. Play the game, but don't believe in it, that much you owe yourself. Even if it lands you in a straight jacket or a padded cell. Play the game, but play it your own way, part of the time at least. Play the game, but raise the ante, my boy. Learn how it operates, learn how you operate, I wish I had time to tell you only a fragment. We're an ass-backward people though. You might even beat the game. It's really a very crude affair. Really pre-Renaissance, and that game has been analyzed, put down in books. But down here they've forgotten to take care of the books and that's your opportunity. You're hidden right out in the open, that is, you would be if you only realized it. They wouldn't see you because they don't expect you to know anything, since they believe they've taken care of that. Man, Who's this they you talking so much about? said Crenshaw. The vet looked annoyed. They? he said. They? Why, the same they we always mean, the white folks, authority, the gods, fate, circumstances, the force that pulls your strings until you refuse to be pulled anymore. The big man who's never there, where you think he is. Crenshaw grimaced. You talk too damn much, man, he said. You talk and you don't say nothing. Oh, I have a lot to say, Crenshaw. I put into words things which most men feel, if only slightly. Sure, I'm a compulsive talker of a kind, but I'm really more clown than fool. But, Crenshaw, he said, rolling a wand of the newspaper which lay across his knees, you don't realize what's happening. Our young friend is going north for the first time. It is for the first time, isn't it? You're right, I said. Of course. Were you ever north before, Crenshaw? I've been all over the country, Crenshaw said. I know how they do it, wherever they do it. And I know how to act too. Besides, you ain't going north, not the real north. You going to Washington? It's just another southern town. Yes, I know, the vet said, but think of what this means for the young fellow. He's going free in the broad daylight and alone. I can remember when young fellows like him had first to commit a crime, or be accused of one, before they tried such a thing. Instead of leaving in the light of morning, they went in the dark of night. And no bus was fast enough, isn't that so, Crenshaw? Crenshaw stopped unwrapping a candy bar and looked at him sharply, his eyes narrowed. How the hell I know? He said. I'm sorry, Crenshaw the vet said. I thought that as a man of experience. Well, I ain't had that experience. I went north of my own free will. But haven't you heard of such cases? Hearing ain't experiencing, Crenshaw said. No, it isn't. But since there's always an element of crime and freedom, I ain't committed no crime. I didn't mean that you had, the vet said. I apologize. Forget it. 
Crenshaw took an angry bite from his candy bar, mumbling, I wish you'd hurry up and get depressive, maybe then you won't talk so damn much. Yes, doctor, the vet said mockingly. I'll be depressive soon enough, but while you eat your candy just allow me to chew the rag, there's a kind of substance in it. Aw, oh, quit trying to show off your education, Crenshaw said. You riding back here in the Jim Crow just like me. Besides, you're a nut. The vet winked at me, continuing his flow of words as the bus got underway. We were going at last and I took a last longing look as the bus shot around the highway which circled the school. I turned and watched it recede from the rear window, the sun caught its treetops, bathed its low-set buildings and ordered grounds. Then it was gone. In less than five minutes the spot of earth which I identified with the best of all possible worlds was gone, lost within the wild uncultivated countryside. A flash of movement drew my eye to the side of the highway now, and I saw a moccasin wiggle swiftly along the grey concrete, vanishing into a length of iron pipe that lay beside the road. I watched the flashing past of cotton fields and cabins, feeling that I was moving into the unknown. The vet and Crenshaw prepared to change buses at the next stop, and upon leaving, the vet placed his hand upon my shoulder and looked at me with kindness, and, as always, he smiled. Now is the time for offering fatherly advice, he said, but I'll have to spare you that, since I guess I'm nobody's father except my own. Perhaps that's the advice to give you, be your own father, young man. And remember. The world is possibility if only you'll discover it. Last of all, leave the Mr. Nortons alone, and if you don't know what I mean, think about it. Farewell. I watched him following Crenshaw through the group of passengers waiting to get on, a short, comical figure turning to wave, then disappearing through the door of the red brick terminal. I sat back with a sigh of relief, yet once the passengers were aboard and the bus underway again, I felt sad and utterly alone. Not until we were sailing through the Jersey countryside did my spirits begin to rise. Then my old confidence and optimism revived, and I tried to plan my time in the North. I would work hard and serve my employer so well that he would shower Dr. Bledsoe with favorable reports. And I would save my money and return in the fall full of New York culture. I'd be indisputably the leading campus figure. Perhaps I would attend town meeting which I had heard over the radio. I'd learn the platform tricks of the leading speakers. And I would make the best of my contacts. When I met the big men to whom my letters were addressed I would put on my best manner. I would speak softly, in my most polished tones, smile agreeably and be most polite, and I would remember that if he, he meant any of the important gentlemen, should begin a tropic of conversation, I would never begin a subject of my own which I found unfamiliar, I would smile and agree. My shoes would be polished, my suit pressed, my hair dressed, not too much grease, and parted on the right side, my nails would be clean and my armpits well deodorized, you had to watch the last item. You couldn't allow them to think all of us smelled bad. The very thought of my contacts gave me a feeling of sophistication, of worldliness, which, as I fingered the seven important letters in my pocket, made me feel light and expansive. I dreamed with my eyes gazing blankly upon the landscape until I looked up to see a red cap frowning down. Buddy, are you getting off here? He said. If so, you better get started. Oh, sure, I said, beginning to move. Sure, but how do you get to Harlem? That's easy, he said. You just keep heading north. And while I got down my bags and my prize briefcase, still as shiny as the night of the battle royal, he instructed me how to take the subway, then I struggled through the crowd. Moving into the subway I was pushed along by the milling salt and pepper mob, seized in the back by a burly, blue uniformed attendant about the size of supercargo, and crammed, bags and all, into a train that was so crowded that everyone seemed to stand with his head back and his eyes bulging like chickens frozen at the sound of danger. 
Then the door banged behind me and I was crushed against a huge woman in black who shook her head and smiled while I stared with horror at a large mole that arose out of the oily whiteness of her skin like a black mountain sweeping out of a rain-wet plain. And all the while I could feel the rubbery softness of her flesh against the length of my body. I could neither turn sideways nor back away, nor set down my bags. I was trapped, so close that simply by nodding my head, I might have brushed her lips with mine. I wanted desperately to raise my hands to show her that it was against my will. I kept expecting her to scream, until finally the car lurched and I was able to free my left arm. I closed my eyes, holding desperately to my lapel. The car roared and swayed, pressing me hard against her, but when I took a furtive glance around no one was paying me the slightest attention. And even she seemed lost in her own thoughts. The train seemed to plunge downhill now, only to lunge to a stop that shot me out upon a platform feeling like something regurgitated from the belly of a frantic whale. Wrestling with my bags, I swept along with the crowd, up the stairs into the hot street. I didn't care where I was, I would walk the rest of the way. For a moment I stood before a shop window staring at my own reflection in the glass, trying to recover from the ride against the woman. I was limp my clothing wet. But you're up north now, I told myself, up north. Yes, but suppose she had screamed. The next time I used the subway I'd always be sure to enter with my hands grasping my lapels and I'd keep them there until I left the train. Why, my god, they must have riots on those things all the time. Why hadn't I read about them? I had never seen so many black people against a background of brick buildings neon signs, plate glass and roaring traffic, not even on trips I had made with a debating team to New Orleans, Dallas or Birmingham. They were everywhere. So many, and moving along with so much tension and noise that I wasn't sure whether they were about to celebrate a holiday or join in a street fight. There were even black girls behind the counters of the 5 and 10 as I passed. Then at the street intersection I had the shock of seeing a black policeman directing traffic, and there were white drivers in the traffic who obeyed his signals as though it was the most natural thing in the world. Sure I had heard of it, but this was real. My courage returned. This really was Harlem, and now all the stories which I had heard of the city within a city leaped alive in my mind. The vet had been right, for me this was not a city of realities, but of dreams perhaps because I had always thought of my life as being confined to the South. And now as I struggled through the lines of people a new world of possibility suggested itself to me faintly, like a small voice that was barely audible in the roar of city sounds. I moved wide-eyed, trying to take the bombardment of impressions. Then I stopped still. It was ahead of me, angry and shrill and upon hearing it I had a sensation of shock and fear such as I had felt as a child when surprised by my father's voice. An emptiness widened in my stomach. Before me a gathering of people were almost blocking the walk, while above them a short squat man shouted angrily from a ladder to which were attached a collection of small American flags. We giant chase him out, the man cried. Out. Tell him about it, Ras, man, a voice called and I saw the squat man shake his fist angrily over the uplifted faces, yelling something in a staccato West Indian accent, at which the crowd yelled threateningly. It was as though a riot would break any minute, against whom I didn't know. I was puzzled, both by the effect of his voice upon me and by the obvious anger of the crowd. I had never seen so many black men angry in public before, and yet others passed the gathering by without even a glance. And as I came alongside, I saw two white policemen talking quietly with one another, their backs turned as they laughed at some joke. Even when the shirt-sleeved crowd cried out in angry affirmation of some remark of the speaker, they paid no attention. I was stunned. I stood gaping at the policemen, my bags settling upon the middle of the walk, until one of them happened to see me and nudged the other, who chewed lazily upon a wad of gum. What can we do for you? Bud? He said. I was just wondering. I said, before I caught myself. Yeah? I was just wondering how to get to men's house, sir, I said. 
Is that all? Yes, sir, I stammered. You sure? Yes, sir. He's a stranger, the other said. Just coming to town, bud? Yes, sir, I said, I just got off the subway. You did, huh? Well, you want to be careful. Oh, I will, sir. That's the idea. Keep it clean, he said, and directed me to men's house. I thanked them and hurried on. The speaker had become more violent than before and his remarks were about the government. The clash between the calm of the rest of the street and the passion of the voice gave the scene a strange out-of-joint quality, and I was careful not to look back lest I see a riot flare. I reached men's house in a sweat, registered, and went immediately to my room. I would have to take Harlem a little at a time. Chapter 8 It was a clean little room with a dark orange bed spread. The chair and dresser were maple and there was a Gideon Bible lying upon a small table. I dropped my bags and sat on the bed. From the street below came the sound of traffic, the larger sound of the subway, the smaller, more varied sounds of voices. Alone in the room, I could hardly believe that I was so far away from home, yet there was nothing familiar in my surroundings. Except the Bible, I picked it up and sat back on the bed, allowing its blood-red-edged pages to ripple beneath my thumb. I remembered how Dr. Bledsoe could quote from the book during his speeches to the student body on Sunday nights. I turned to the book of Genesis, but could not read. I thought of home and the attempts my father had made to institute family prayer, the gathering around the stove at mealtime and kneeling with heads bowed over the seats of our chairs, his voice quavering and full of church house rhetoric and verbal humility. But this made me homesick and I put the Bible aside. This was New York. I had to get a job and earn money. I took off my coat and hat and took my packet of letters and lay back upon the bed, drawing a feeling of importance from reading the important names. What was inside, and how could I open them undetected? They were tightly sealed. I had read that letters were sometimes steamed open, but I had no steam. I gave it up, I really didn't need to know their contents and it would not be honorable or safe to tamper with Dr. Bledsoe. I knew already that they concerned me and were addressed to some of the most important men in the whole country. That was enough. I caught myself wishing for someone to show the letters to, someone who could give me a proper reflection of my importance. Finally, I went to the mirror and gave myself an admiring smile as I spread the letters upon the dresser like a hand of high trump cards. Then I began to map my campaign for the next day. First, I would have a shower, then get breakfast. All this very early. I'd have to move fast. With important men like that you had to be on time. If you made an appointment with one of them, you couldn't bring them any slow CP, colored people's, time. Yes, and I would have to get a watch. I would do everything to schedule. I recalled the heavy gold chain that hung between Dr. Bledsoe's vest pockets and the air with which he snapped his watch open to consult the time, his lips burst, chin pulled in so that it multiplied, his forehead wrinkled. Then he'd clear his throat and give a deeply intoned order, as though each syllable were pregnant with nuances of profoundly important meaning. I recalled my expulsion, feeling quick anger and attempting to suppress it immediately, but now I was not quite successful, my resentment stuck out at the edges, making me uncomfortable. Maybe it was best, I thought hastily. Maybe if it hadn't happened I would never have received an opportunity to meet such important men face to face. In my mind's eye I continued to see him gazing into his watch, but now he was joined by another figure, a younger figure, myself, become shrewd, suave and dressed not in somber garments, like his old-fashioned ones, but in a dapper suit of rich material, cut fashionably, like those of the men you saw in magazine ads the junior executive types in Esquire. I imagined myself making a speech and caught in striking poses by flashing cameras, snapped at the end of some period of dazzling eloquence. A younger version of the doctor, less crude, indeed polished. I would hardly ever speak above a whisper and I would always be, yes, there was no other word, I would be charming. Like Ronald Coleman. What a voice. Of course you couldn't speak that way in the South, 
the white folks wouldn't like it, and the Negroes would say that you were putting on. But here in the North I would slough off my southern ways of speech. Indeed, I would have one way of speaking in the North and another in the South. Give them what they wanted down South, that was the way. If Dr. Bledsoe could do it, so could I before going to bed that night I wiped off my briefcase with a clean towel and placed the letters carefully inside. The next morning I took an early subway into the Wall Street district, selecting an address that carried me almost to the end of the island. It was dark with the dullness of the buildings and the narrow streets. Armored cars with alert guards went past as I looked for the number. The streets were full of hurrying people who walked as though they had been wound up and were directed by some unseen control. Many of the men carried dispatch cases and briefcases and I gripped mine with a sense of importance. And here and there I saw Negroes who hurried along with leather pouches strapped to their wrists. They reminded me fleetingly of prisoners carrying their leg irons as they escaped from a chain gang. Yet they seemed aware of some self-importance, and I wished to stop one and ask him why he was chained to his pouch. Maybe they got paid well for this, maybe they were chained to money. Perhaps the man with run-down heels ahead of me was chained to a million dollars. I looked to see if there were policemen or detectives with drawn guns following, but there was no one. Or if so, they were hidden in the hurrying crowd. I wanted to follow one of the men to see where he was going. Why did they trust him with all that money? And what would happen if he should disappear with it? But of course no one would be that foolish. This was Wall Street. Perhaps it was guarded, as I had been told post offices were guarded, by men who looked down at you through peepholes in the ceiling and walls, watching you constantly, silently waiting for a wrong move. Perhaps even now and I had picked me up and watched my every movement. Maybe the face of that clock set in the gray building across the street hid a pair of searching eyes. I hurried to my address and was challenged by the sheer height of the white stone with its sculptured bronze fa. Da. Men and women hurried inside, and after staring for a moment I followed, taking the elevator and being pushed to the back of the car. It rose like a rocket, creating a sensation in my crotch as though an important part of myself had been left below in the lobby. At the last stop I left the car and went down a stretch of marble hallway until I found the door marked with the trustee's name. But starting to enter I lost my nerve and backed away. I looked down the hall. It was empty. White folks were funny, Mr. Bates might not wish to see a Negro the first thing in the morning. I turned and walked down the hall and looked out of the window. I would wait a while. Below me lay South Ferry and a ship and two barges were passing out into the river, and far out and to the right I could make out the Statue of Liberty, her torch almost lost in the fog. Back along the shore, gulls soared through the mist above the docks, and down, so far below that it made me dizzy, crowds were moving. I looked back to a ferry passing the Statue of Liberty now, its backwash a curving line upon the bay and three gulls swooping down behind it. Behind me the elevator was letting off passengers, and I heard the cheery voices of women going chattering down the hall. Soon I would have to go in. My uncertainty grew. My appearance worried me. Mr. Bates might not like my suit, or the cut of my hair, and my chance of a job would be lost. I looked at his name typed neatly across the envelope and wondered how he earned his money. He was a millionaire, I knew. Maybe he had always been, maybe he was born a millionaire. Never before had I been so curious about money as now that I believed I was surrounded by it. Perhaps I would get a job here and after a few years would be sent up and down the streets with millions strapped to my arms, a trusted messenger. Then I'd be sent south again to head the college, just as the mayor's cook had been made principal of the school after she'd become too lame to stand before her stove. Only I wouldn't stay north that long, they'd need me before that. But now for the interview. Entering the office I found myself face to face with a young woman who looked up from her desk as I glanced swiftly over the large light room, over the comfortable chairs, the ceiling high bookcases with gold and leather bindings, past a series of portraits and back again, to meet her questioning eyes. She was alone and I thought, well, at least I'm not too early. 
Good morning, she said, betraying none of the antagonism I had expected. Good morning, I said, advancing. How should I begin? Yes? Is this Mr. Bates' office? I said. Why, yes, it is, she said. Have you an appointment? No, Mom, I said, and quickly hated myself for saying Mom to so young a white woman, and in the North too. I removed the letter from my briefcase, but before I could explain, she said, May I see it, please? I hesitated. I did not wish to surrender the letter except to Mr. Bates, but there was a command in the extended hand, and I obeyed. I surrendered it, expecting her to open it, but instead, after looking at the envelope she rose and disappeared behind a paneled door without a word. Back across the expanse of carpet to the door which I had entered I noticed several chairs but was undecided to go there. I stood, my hat in my hand, looking around me. One wall caught my eyes. It was hung with three portraits of dignified old gentlemen in wing collars who looked down from their frames with an assurance and arrogance that I had never seen in any except white men and a few bad, razor-scarred negroes. Not even Dr. Bledsoe, who had but to look around him without speaking to set the teachers to trembling, had such assurance. So these were the kind of men who stood behind him. How did they fit in with the southern white folks, with the men who gave me my scholarship? I was still staring, caught in the spell of power and mystery, when the secretary returned. She looked at me oddly and smiled. I'm very sorry, she said, but Mr. Bates is just too busy to see you this morning and asks that you leave your name and address. You'll hear from him by mail. I stood silent with disappointment. Write it here, she said, giving me a card. I'm sorry she said again as I scribbled my address and prepared to leave. I can be reached here at any time, I said. Very good, she said. You should hear very soon. She seemed very kind and interested, and I left in good spirits. My fears were groundless, there was nothing to it. This was New York. I succeeded in reaching several trustees secretaries during the days that followed, and all were friendly and encouraging. Some looked at me strangely, but I dismissed it since it didn't appear to be antagonism. Perhaps they're surprised to see someone like me with introductions to such important men, I thought. Well, there were unseen lines that ran from north to south, and Mr. Norton had called me his destiny. I swung my briefcase with confidence. With things going so well I distributed my letters in the mornings, and saw the city during the afternoons. Walking about the streets, sitting on subways beside whites, eating with them in the same cafeterias, although I avoided their tables, gave me the eerie, out-of-focus sensation of a dream. My clothes felt ill-fitting, and for all my letters to men of power, I was unsure of how I should act. For the first time, as I swung along the streets, I thought consciously of how I had conducted myself at home. I hadn't worried too much about whites as people. Some were friendly and some were not, and you tried not to offend either. But here they all seemed impersonal, and yet when most impersonal they startled me by being polite, by begging my pardon after brushing against me in a crowd. Still I felt that even when they were polite they hardly saw me, that they would have begged the pardon of Jack the Bear, never glancing his way if the bear happened to be walking along minding his business. It was confusing. I did not know if it was desirable or undesirable. But my main concern was seeing the trustees and after more than a week of seeing the city and being vaguely encouraged by secretaries, I became impatient. I had distributed all but the letter to a Mr. Emerson, who I knew from the papers was away from the city. Several times I started down to see what had happened but changed my mind. I did not wish to seem too impatient. But time was becoming short. Unless I found work soon I would never earn enough to enter school by fall. I had already written home that I was working for a member of the trustee board, and the only letter I had received so far was one telling me how wonderful they thought it was and warning me against the ways of the wicked city. Now I couldn't write them for money without revealing that I had been lying about the job. Finally I tried to reach the important men by telephone only to receive polite refusals by their secretaries. 
but fortunately I still had the letter to Mr. Emerson. I decided to use it, but instead of handing it over to a secretary, I wrote a letter explaining that I had a message from Dr. Bledsoe and requesting an appointment. Maybe I've been wrong about the secretaries, I thought, maybe they destroyed the letters. I should have been more careful. I thought of Mr. Norton. If only the last letter had been addressed to him. If only he lived in New York so that I could make a personal appeal. Somehow I felt closer to Mr. Norton, and felt that if he should see me, he would remember that it was I whom he connected so closely to his fate. Now it seemed ages ago and in a different season and a distant land. Actually, it was less than a month. I became energetic and wrote him a letter, expressing my belief that my future would be immeasurably different if only I could work for him, that he would be benefited as well as I. I was especially careful to allow some indication of my ability to come through the appeal. I spent several hours on the typing, destroying copy after copy until I had completed one that was immaculate, carefully phrased and most respectful. I hurried down and posted it before the final mail collection, suddenly seized with a dizzy conviction that it would bring results. I remained about the building for three days awaiting an answer. But the letter brought no reply. Nor, any more than a prayer unanswered by God, was it returned. My doubts grew. Perhaps all was not well. I remained in my room all the next day. I grew conscious that I was afraid, more afraid here in my room than I had ever been in the South. And all the more, because here there was nothing concrete to lay it to. All the secretaries had been encouraging. In the evening I went out to a movie, a picture of frontier life with heroic Indian fighting and struggles against flood, storm and forest fire with the outnumbered settlers winning each engagement, an epic of wagon trains rolling ever westward. I forgot myself, although there was no one like me taking part in the adventures, and left the dark room in a lighter mood. But that night I dreamed of my grandfather and awoke depressed. I walked out of the building with a queer feeling that I was playing a part in some scheme which I did not understand. Somehow I felt that Bledsoe and Norton were behind it and all day I was inhibited in both speech and conduct, for fear that I might say or do something scandalous. But this was all fantastic, I told myself. I was being too impatient. I could wait for the trustees to make a move. Perhaps I was being subjected to a test of some kind. They hadn't told me the rules, I knew, but the feeling persisted. Perhaps my exile would end suddenly and I would be given a scholarship to return to the campus. But when? How long? Something had to happen soon. I would have to find a job to tide me over. My money was almost gone and anything might happen. I had been so confident that I had failed to put aside the price of train fare home. I was miserable and I dared not talk to anyone about my problems, not even the officials at Men's House. For since they had learned that I was to be assigned to an important job, they treated me with a certain deference, therefore I was careful to hide my growing doubts. After all, I thought, I might have to ask for credit and I'll have to appear a good risk. No, the thing to do was to keep faith. I'd start out once more in the morning. Something was certain to happen tomorrow. And it did. I received a letter from Mr. Emerson, Chapter 9. It was a clear bright day when I went out, and the sun burned warm upon my eyes. Only a few flecks of snowy cloud hung high in the morning blue sky, and already a woman was hanging wash on a roof. I felt better walking along. A feeling of confidence grew. Far down the island the skyscrapers rose dull and mysterious in the thin, pastel haze. A milk truck went past. I thought of the school. What were they doing now on the campus? Had the moon sunk low and the sun climbed clear? Had the breakfast bugle blown? Did the bellow of the big seed bull awaken the girls in the dorms this morning as on most spring mornings when I was there, sounding clear and full above bells and bugles and early workaday sounds? I hurried along, encouraged by the memories, and suddenly I was seized with a certainty that today was the day. Something would happen. I patted my briefcase, thinking of the letter inside. The last had been first, a good sign. 
Close to the curb ahead I saw a man pushing a cart piled high with rolls of blue paper and heard him singing in a clear ringing voice. It was a blues, and I walked along behind him remembering the times that I had heard such singing at home. It seemed that here some memories slipped around my life at the campus and went far back to things I had long ago shut out of my mind. There was no escaping such reminders. She's got feet like a monkey legs like a frog, laud, laud. But when she starts to loving me I holler woo oo god dog. Cause I loves my babay, better than I do myself. And as I drew alongside I was startled to hear him call to me, look a year. Buddy. Yes, I said, pausing to look into his reddish eyes. Tell me just one thing this very fine morning, hey. Wait a minute, daddy -o, I'm going your way. What is it? I said. What I want to know is, he said, is you got the dog. Dog? What dog? Show, he said, stopping his cart and resting it on its support. That's it. Who? He halted to crouch with one foot on the curb like a country preacher about to pound his Bible, got. The. Dog, his head snapping with each word like an angry rooster's. I laughed nervously and stepped back. He watched me out of shrewd eyes. Oh, God dog, daddy -o, he said with a sudden bluster, who got the damn dog? Now I know you from down home, how come you trying to act like you never heard that before? Hell. Ain't nobody out here this morning but us colored, why you trying to deny me? Suddenly I was embarrassed and angry. Deny you? What do you mean? Just answer the question. Is you got him, or ain't you? A dog? Yeah, the dog. I was exasperated. No, not this morning, I said and saw a grin spread over his face. Wait a minute, daddy. Now don't go get mad. Damn, man. I thought Joe you had him, he said, pretending to disbelieve me. I started away and he pushed the cart beside me. And suddenly I felt uncomfortable. Somehow he was like one of the vets from the golden day. Well, maybe it's the other way round, he said. Maybe he got hold to you. Maybe, I said. If he is, you lucky it's just a dog, cuz, man, I tell you I believe it's a bear that's got hold to me. A bear? Hell, yes. The bear. Can't you see these patches where he's been clawing at my behind? Pulling the seat of his Charlie Chaplin pants to the side, he broke into deep laughter. Man, this Harlem ain't nothing but a bear's den. But I tell you one thing, he said with swiftly sobering face, it's the best place in the world for you and me, and if times don't get better soon I'm going to grab that bear and turn him every way but loose. Don't let him get you down, I said. No, daddy -o, I'm going to start with one my own size. I tried to think of some saying about bears to reply, but remembered only Jack the Rabbit, Jack the Bear, who were both long forgotten and now brought a wave of homesickness. I wanted to leave him, and yet I found a certain comfort in walking along beside him, as though we'd walked this way before through other mornings, in other places. What is all that you have there? I said, pointing to the rolls of blue paper stacked in the cart. Blueprints, man. Here I got bout a hundred pounds of blueprints and I couldn't build nothing. What are they blueprints for? I said. Damn if I know, everything. Cities, towns, country clubs. Some just buildings and houses. I got damn near enough to build me a house if I could live in a paper house like they do in Japan. I guess somebody done changed their plans, he added with a laugh. I asked the man why they getting rid of all this stuff and he said they get in the way so everyone's in a while they have to throw em out to make place for the new plans. Plenty of these ain't never been used, you know. You have quite a lot, I said. Yeah, this ain't all neither. I got a couple loads. There's a day's work right here in this stuff. Folks is always making plans and changing em. Yes, that's right, I said, thinking of my letters, but that's a mistake. You have to stick to the plan. He looked at me, suddenly grave. You kinda young, daddy -o, he said. I did not answer. We came to a corner at the top of a hill. Well, daddy -o, 
It's been good talking with a youngster from the old country but I got to leave you now. This here's one of them good LA downhill streets. I can coast a while and won't be worn out at the end of the day. Damn if I may let him run me into my grave. I be seeing you again sometime, and you know something? What's that? I thought you was trying to deny me at first, but now I be pretty glad to see you. I hope so, I said. And you take it easy. Oh, I'll do that. All it takes to get along in this here man's town is a little shit, grit and mother wit. And man, I was born with all three. In F-A-C-T, Ms. Evans no face events and born with the call over by the yes and raise a dumb black cat bon a shy gent the conqueror and greasy greens, he spieled with twinkling eyes, his lips working rapidly. You dig me, daddy? You're going too fast, I said, beginning to laugh. Okay, I'm slowing down. I'll verse you but I won't curse you, my name is Peter Weedstraw, I'm the devil's only son-in-law, so roll em. You a southern boy, ain't you? He said, his head to one side like a bear's. Yes, I said. Well, get with it. My name's Blue and I'm coming at you with a pitchfork. Fay fi fo fem. Who wants to shoot the devil one, Lord God Stingroy? He had me grinning despite myself. I liked his words though I didn't know the answer. I'd known the stuff from childhood, but had forgotten it, had learned it back of school. You digging me, daddy? He laughed. Huh, but look me up sometimes, I'm a piano player and a rounder, a whiskey drinker and a pavement pounder. I'll teach you some good bad habits. You'll need em. Good luck, he said. So long, I said and watched him going. I watched him push around the corner to the top of the hill leaning sharp against the card handle, and heard his voice arise, muffled now, as he started down. She's got feet like a monkey e legs legs, legs like a med bull dog. What does it mean, I thought. I'd heard it all my life but suddenly the strangeness of it came through to me. Was it about a woman or about some strange sphinx-like animal? Certainly his woman, no woman, fitted that description. And why describe anyone in such contradictory words? Was it a sphinx? Did old chaplain pants, old dusty butt? love her or hate her, or was he merely singing? What kind of woman could love a dirty fellow like that, anyway? And how could even he love her if she were as repulsive as the song described? I moved ahead. Perhaps everyone loved someone, I didn't know. I couldn't give much thought to love, in order to travel far you had to be detached, and I had the long road back to the campus before me. I strode along, hearing the Cartman's song become a lonesome broad-toned whistle now that flowered at the end of each phrase into a tremulous, blue-toned chord. And in its flutter and swoop I heard the sound of a railroad train highballing it, lonely across the lonely night. He was the devil's son-in-law, all right, and he was a man who could whistle a three-toned chord. Goddamn, I thought, they're a hell of a people. And I didn't know whether it was pride or disgust that suddenly flashed over me. At the corner I turned into a drugstore and took a seat at the counter. Several men were bent over plates of food. Glass globes of coffee simmered above blue flames. I could feel the odor of frying bacon reach deep into my stomach as I watched the countermen open the doors of the grill and turn the lean strips over and bang the doors shut again. Above, facing the counter, a blonde, sunburned college girl smiled down, inviting all and sundry to drink a coke. The counterman came over. I've got something good for you, he said, placing a glass of water before me. How about the special? What's the special? Pork chops, grits, one egg, hot biscuits and coffee. He leaned over the counter with a look that seemed to say, there, that ought to excite you, boy. Could everyone see that I was southern? I'll have orange juice, toast and coffee, I said coldly. He shook his head, you fooled me, he said, slamming two pieces of bread into the toaster. I would have sworn you were a pork chop man. Is that juice large or small? Make it large, I said. I looked silently at the back of his head as he sliced an orange, thinking, I should order this special and get up and walk out. Who does he think he is? 
A seed floated in the thick layer of pulp that formed at the top of the glass. I fished it out with a spoon and then down the acid drink, proud to have resisted the pork chops and grits. It was an act of discipline, a sign of the change that was coming over me and which would return me to college a more experienced man. I would be basically the same, I thought, stirring my coffee, yet so subtly changed as to intrigue those who had never been north. It always helped at the college to be a little different, especially if you wished to play a leading role. It made the folks talk about you, try to figure you out. I had to be careful though, not to speak too much like a northern negro, they wouldn't like that. The thing to do, I thought with a smile, was to give them hints that whatever you did or said was weighted with broad and mysterious meanings that lay just beneath the surface. They'd love that. And the vaguer you told things, the better. You had to keep them guessing, just as they guessed about Dr. Bledsoe. Did Dr. Bledsoe stop at an expensive white hotel when he visited New York? Did he go on parties with the trustees? And how did he act? Man, I bet he has him a fine time. They tell me when Ole Doc gets to New York he don't stop for the red lights. Say he drinks his good red whiskey and smokes his good black cigars and forgets all about you Ole no nothing Negroes down here on the campus. Say when he gets up north he makes everybody call him Mr. Dr. Bledsoe. I smiled as the conversation came back to my mind. I felt good. Perhaps it was all to the best that I had been sent away. I had learned more. Heretofore all the campus gossip had seemed merely malicious and disrespectful, now I could see the advantage for Dr. Bledsoe. Whether we liked him or not, he was never out of our minds. That was a secret of leadership. Strange I should think of it now, for although I'd never given it any thought before, I seemed to have known it all along. Only here the distance from the campus seemed to make it clear and hard, and I thought it without fear. Here it came to hand just as easily as the coin which I now placed on the counter for my breakfast. It was fifteen cents and as I felt for a nickel I took out another dime, thinking, is it an insult when one of us tips one of them? I looked for the counterman, seeing him serving a plate of pork chops and grits to a man with a pale blonde mustache, and stared, then I slapped the dime on the counter and left, annoyed that the dime did not ring as loud as a fifty cent piece. When I reached the door of Mr. Emerson's office it occurred to me that perhaps I should have waited until the business of the day was underway, but I disregarded the idea and went ahead. My being early would be, I hoped an indication of both how badly I wanted work, and how promptly I would perform any assignment given me. Besides, wasn't there a saying that the first person of the day to enter a business would get a bargain? Or was that said only of Jewish business? I removed the letter from my briefcase. Was Emerson a Christian or a Jewish name? Beyond the door it was like a museum. I had entered a large reception room decorated with cool tropical colors. One wall was almost covered by a huge colored map, from which narrow red silk ribbons stretched tautly from each division of the map to a series of ebony pedestals, upon which sat glass specimen jars containing natural products of the various countries. It was an importing firm. I looked around the room, amazed. There were paintings, bronzes, tapestries, all beautifully arranged. I was dazzled and so taken aback that I almost dropped my briefcase when I heard a voice say, and what would your business be? I saw the figure out of a Colorado, ruddy face with blonde hair faultlessly in place, a tropical weave suit draped handsomely from his broad shoulders, his eyes gray and nervous behind clear framed glasses. I explained my appointment. Oh, yes, he said. May I see the letter, please? I handed it over, noticing the gold links in the soft white cuffs as he extended his hand. Glancing at the envelope he looked back at me with a strange interest in his eyes and said, Have a seat, please. I'll be with you in a moment. I watched him leave noiselessly, moving with a long hip swinging stride that caused me to frown. I went over and took a teakwood chair with cushions of emerald green silk, sitting stiffly with my briefcase across my knees. He must have been sitting there when I came in, for on a table that held a beautiful dwarf tree I saw smoke rising from a cigarette in a J-tray. 
an open book, something called Totem and Taboo, lay beside it. I looked across to a lighted case of Chinese design which held delicate-looking statues of horses and birds, small vases and bowls, each set upon a carved wooden base. The room was quiet as a tomb, until suddenly there was a savage beating of wings and I looked toward the window to see an eruption of color, as though a gale had whipped up a bundle of brightly colored rags. It was an aviary of tropical birds set near one of the broad windows, through which, as the clapping of wings settled down, I could see two ships plying far out upon the greenish bay below. A large bird began a song, drawing my eyes to the throbbing of its bright blue, red and yellow throat. It was startling and I watched the surge and flutter of the birds as their colors flared for an instant like an unfurled oriental fan. I wanted to go and stand near the cage for a better view, but decided against it. It might seem unbusinesslike. I observed the room from the chair. These folks are the kings of the earth. I thought, hearing the bird make an ugly noise. There was nothing like this at the college museum, or anywhere else that I had ever been. I recalled only a few cracked relics from slavery times, an iron pot, an ancient bell a set of ankle irons and links of chain, a primitive loom, a spinning wheel, a gourd for drinking, an ugly ebony African god that seemed to sneer, presented to the school by some traveling millionaire, a leather whip with copper brads, a branding iron with the double letter M. Though I had seen them very seldom, they were vivid in my mind. They had not been pleasant and whenever I had visited the room I avoided the glass case in which they rested preferring instead to look at photographs of the early days after the Civil War, the times close to those blind Barbie had described. And I had not looked even at these too often. I tried to relax, the chair was beautiful but hard. Where had the man gone? Had he shown any antagonism when he saw me? I was annoyed that I had failed to see him first. One had to watch such details. Suddenly there came a harsh cry from the cage, and once more I saw a mad flashing as though the birds had burst into spontaneous flame, fluttering and beating their wings maliciously against the bamboo bars, only to settle down just as suddenly when the door opened and the blonde man stood beckoning, his hand upon the knob. I went over, tense inside me. Had I been accepted or rejected? There was a question in his eyes. Come in, please he said. Thank you, I said, waiting to follow him. Please, he said with a slight smile. I moved ahead of him, sounding the tone of his words for a sign. I want to ask you a few questions, he said, waving my letter at two chairs. Yes, sir, I said. Tell me, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? He said. I want a job, sir, so that I can earn enough money to return to college in the fall. To your old school? Yes, sir. I see. For a moment he studied me silently. When do you expect to graduate? Next year, sir. I've completed my junior classes. Oh, you have? That's very good. And how old are you? Almost twenty, sir. A junior at nineteen? You are a good student. Thank you, sir, I said, beginning to enjoy the interview. Were you an athlete? he asked. No, sir. You have the build, he said, looking me up and down. You'd probably make an excellent runner, a sprinter. I've never tried, sir. And I suppose it's silly even to ask what you think of your alma mater? He said. I think it's one of the best in the world, I said, hearing my voice surge with deep feeling. I know, I know, he said, with a swift displeasure that surprised me. I became alert again as he mumbled something incomprehensible about nostalgia for Harvard Yard. But what if you were offered an opportunity to finish your work at some other college, he said, his eyes widening behind his glasses. His smile had returned. Another college? I asked, my mind beginning to whirl. Why, yes, say some school in New England. I looked at him speechlessly. Did he mean Harvard? Was this good or bad? Where was it leading? I don't know, sir, I said cautiously. I've never thought about it. I've only a year more, and, well, I know everyone at my old school and they know me. 
I came to a confused halt, seeing him look at me with a sigh of resignation. What was on his mind? Perhaps I had been too frank about returning to the college, maybe he was against our having a higher education. But hell, he's only a secretary. Or is he? I understand, he said calmly. It was presumptuous of me to even suggest another school. I guess one's college is really a kind of mother and father. A sacred matter. Yes, sir. That's it, I said in hurried agreement. His eyes narrowed. But now I must ask you an embarrassing question. Do you mind? Why, no, sir, I said nervously. I don't like to ask this, but it's quite necessary. He leaned forward with a pained frown. Tell me, did you read the letter which you brought to Mr. Emerson? This, he said, taking the letter from the table. Why, no, sir. It wasn't addressed to me, so naturally I wouldn't think of opening it. Of course not, I know you wouldn't, he said, fluttering his hand and sitting erect. I'm sorry and you must dismiss it, like one of those annoying personal questions you find so often nowadays on supposedly impersonal forms. I didn't believe him. But was it opened, sir? Someone might have gone into my things. Oh, no, nothing like that. Please forget the question. And tell me, please, what are your plans after graduation? I'm not sure, sir. I'd like to be asked to remain at the college as a teacher, or as a member of the administrative staff. And? Well. Yes? And what else? Well, er, I guess I'd really like to become Dr. Bledsoe's assistant. Oh, I see, he said, sitting back and forming his mouth into a thin-lipped circle. You're very ambitious. I guess I am, sir. But I'm willing to work hard. Ambition is a wonderful force, he said, but sometimes it can be blinding. On the other hand, it can make you successful, like my father. A new edge came into his voice and he frowned and looked down at his hands, which were trembling. The only trouble with ambition is that it sometimes blinds one to realities. Tell me, how many of these letters do you have? I had about seven, sir, I replied, confused by his new turn. There, seven. He was suddenly angry. Yes, sir, that was all he gave me. And how many of these gentlemen have you succeeded in seeing, may I ask? A sinking feeling came over me. I haven't seen any of them personally, sir. And this is your last letter? Yes, sir, it is, but I expect to hear from the others. They said, of course you will, and from all seven. They're all loyal Americans. There was unmistakable irony in his voice now, and I didn't know what to say. Seven, he repeated mysteriously. Oh, don't let me upset you, he said with an elegant gesture of self-disgust. I had a difficult session with my analyst last evening and the slightest thing is apt to set me off. Like an alarm clock without control, say. He said, slapping his palm against his thighs. What on earth does that mean? Suddenly he was in a state. One side of his face had begun to twitch and swell. I watched him light a cigarette, thinking, what on earth is this all about? Some things are just too unjust for words, he said, expelling a plume of smoke, and too ambiguous for either speech or ideas. By the way, have you ever been to the Club Calamus? I don't think I've ever heard of it, sir, I said. You haven't? It's very well known. Many of my Harlem friends go there. It's a rendezvous for writers, artists and all kinds of celebrities. There's nothing like it in the city, and by some strange twist it has a truly continental flavor. I've never been to a nightclub, sir. I'll have to go there to see what it's like after I've started earning some money, I said, hoping to bring the conversation back to the problem of jobs. He looked at me with a jerk of his head his face beginning to twitch again. I suppose I've been evading the issue again, as always. Look, he burst out impulsively. Do you believe that two people, two strangers who have never seen one another before can speak with utter frankness and sincerity? Sir? Oh, damn. What I mean is, do you believe it possible for us, the two of us, to throw off the mask of custom and manners that insulate man from man?
and converse in naked honesty and frankness. I don't know what you mean exactly, sir. I said. Are you sure? I. Of course, of course. If I could only speak plainly. I'm confusing you. Such frankness just isn't possible because all our motives are impure. Forget what I just said. I'll try to put it this way, and remember this, please. My head spun. He was addressing me, leaning forward confidentially, as though he'd known me for years, and I remembered something my grandfather had said long ago, don't let no white man tell you his business, cause after he tells you he's liable to get shame he told it to you and then he'll hate you. Fact is, he was hating you all the time. I want to try to reveal a part of reality that is most important to you, but I warn you, it's going to hurt. No, let me finish, he said, touching my knee lightly and quickly removing his hand as I shifted my position. What I want to do is done very seldom, and, to be honest, it wouldn't happen now if I hadn't sustained a series of impossible frustrations. You see, well, I'm thwarted. Oh, damn, there I go again, thinking only of myself. We're both frustrated, understand? Both of us, and I want to help you. You mean you'll let me see Mr. Emerson? He frowned. Please don't seem so happy about it, and don't leap to conclusions. I want to help, but there is a tyranny involved. A tyranny? My lungs tightened. Yes. That's a way of putting it because to help you I must disillusion you. Oh, I don't think I mind, sir. Once I see Mr. Emerson, it'll be up to me. All I want to do is speak to him. Speak to him, he said, getting quickly to his feet and mashing his cigarette into the tray with shaking fingers. No one speaks to him. He does the speaking, suddenly he broke off. On second thought, Perhaps you'd better leave me your address and I'll mail you Mr. Emerson's reply in the morning. He's really a very busy man. His whole manner had changed. But you said. I stood up, completely confused. Was he having fun with me? Couldn't you let me talk to him for just five minutes? I pleaded. I'm sure I can convince him that I'm worthy of a job. And if there's someone who has tampered with my letter, I'll prove my identity. Dr. Bledsoe would, identity. My God. Who has any identity anymore anyway? It isn't so perfectly simple. Look, he said with an anguished gesture. Will you trust me? Why, yes, sir, I trust you. He leaned forward. Look, he said, his face working violently, I was trying to tell you that I know many things about you, not you personally, but fellows like you. Not much either, but still more than the average. With us it's still Jim and Huck Finn. A number of my friends are jazz musicians, and I've been around. I know the conditions under which you live, why go back, fellow? There is so much you could do here where there is more freedom. You won't find what you're looking for when you return anyway, because so much is involved that you can't possibly know. Please don't misunderstand me, I don't say all this to impress you or to give myself some kind of sadistic catharsis. Truly, I don't. But I do know this world you're trying to contact, all its virtues and all its unspeakables, ha, huh, yes, unspeakables. I'm afraid my father considers me one of the unspeakables. I'm Huckleberry, you see. He laughed dryly as I tried to make sense of his ramblings. Huckleberry? Why did he keep talking about that kid's story? I was puzzled and annoyed that he could talk to me this way because he stood between me and a job, the campus. But I only want a job, sir, I said. I only want to make enough money to return to my studies. Of course, but surely you suspect there is more to it than that. Aren't you curious about what lies behind the face of things? Yes, sir, but I'm mainly interested in a job. Of course, he said, but life isn't that simple. But I'm not bothered about all the other things, whatever they are, sir. They're not for me to interfere with and I'll be satisfied to go back to college and remain there as long as they'll allow me to. But I want to help you do what is best, he said. What's best, mind you? Do you wish to do what's best for yourself? Why, yes, sir. I suppose I do. 
Then forget about returning to the college. Go somewhere else. You mean leave? Yes, forget it. But you said that you would help me. I did and I am, but what about seeing Mr. Emerson? Oh, God. Don't you see that it's best that you do not see him? Suddenly I could not breathe. Then I was standing, gripping my briefcase. What have you got against me? I blurted. What did I ever do to you? You never intended to let me see him. Even though I presented my letter of introduction. Why? Why? I'd never endanger your job, no, no, no. Of course not, he cried, getting to his feet. You've misunderstood me. You mustn't do that. God, there's too much misunderstanding. Please don't think I'm trying to prevent you from seeing my, from seeing Mr. Emerson out of prejudice. Yes, sir, I do, I said angrily. I was sent here by a friend of his. You read the letter, but still you refuse to let me see him, and now you're trying to get me to leave college. What kind of man are you, anyway? What have you got against me? You, a northern white man. He looked pained. I've done it badly, he said, but you must believe that I am trying to advise you what is best for you. He snatched off his glasses. But I know what's best for me, I said. Or at least Dr. Bledsoe does, and if I can't see Mr. Emerson today, just tell me when I can and I'll be here. He bit his lips and shut his eyes shaking his head from side to side as though fighting back a scream. I'm sorry, really sorry that I started all of this, he said, suddenly calm. It was foolish of me to try to advise you, but please, you mustn't believe that I'm against you. Or your race. I'm your friend. Some of the finest people I know are neg, well, you see, Mr. Emerson is my father. Your father. My father, yes though I would have preferred it otherwise. But he is, and I could arrange for you to see him. But to be utterly frank, I'm incapable of such cynicism. It would do you no good. But I'd like to take my chances, Mr. Emerson, sir. This is very important to me. My whole career depends upon it. But you have no chance, he said. But Dr. Bledsoe sent me here, I said, growing more excited. I must have a chance. Dr. Bledsoe, he said with distaste. He's like my. He ought to be horsewhipped. Here, he said, sweeping up the letter and thrusting it crackling toward me. I took it, looking into his eyes that burned back at me. Go on, read it, he cried excitedly. Go on. But I wasn't asking for this, I said. Read it. My dear Mr. Emerson, the bearer of this letter is a former student of ours, I say former because he shall never, under any circumstances, be enrolled as a student here again, who has been expelled for a most serious defection from our strictest rules of deportment. Do, however, to circumstances the nature of which I shall explain to you in person on the occasion of the next meeting of the board, it is to the best interests of the college that this young man have no knowledge of the finality of his expulsion. For it is indeed his hope to return here to his classes in the fall. However, it is to the best interests of the great work which we are dedicated to perform, that he continue undisturbed in these vain hopes while remaining as far as possible from our midst. This case represents, my dear Mr. Emerson, one of the rare, delicate instances in which one for whom we held great expectations has gone grievously astray, and who in his fall threatens to upset certain delicate relationships between certain interested individuals and the school. Thus, while the bearer is no longer a member of our scholastic family, it is highly important that his severance with the college be executed as painlessly as possible. I beg of you sir, to help him continue in the direction of that promise which, like the horizon, recedes ever brightly and distantly beyond the hopeful traveler. Respectfully, I am your humble servant, A. Herbert bled so I raised my head. Twenty-five years seemed to have lapsed between his handing me the letter and my grasping its message. I could not believe it, tried to read it again. I could not believe it, yet I had a feeling that it all had happened before. I rubbed my eyes, and they felt sandy as though all the fluids had suddenly dried. I'm sorry, he said. I'm terribly sorry. 
What did I do? I always tried to do the right thing that you must tell me, he said. To what does he refer? I don't know, I don't know. But you must have done something. I took a man for a drive, showed him into the golden day to help him when he became ill, I don't know I told him falteringly of the visit to True Bloods and the trip to the golden day and of my expulsion, watching his mobile face reflecting his reaction to each detail. It's little enough, he said when I had finished. I don't understand the man. He is very complicated. I only wanted to return and help, I said. You'll never return. You can't return now, he said. Don't you see? I'm terribly sorry and yet I'm glad that I gave in to the impulse to speak to you. Forget it, though that's advice which I've been unable to accept myself, it's still good advice. There is no point in blinding yourself to the truth. Don't blind yourself. I got up, dazed, and started toward the door. He came behind me into the reception room where the birds flamed in the cage, their squawks like screams in a nightmare. He stammered guiltily, Please, I must ask you never to mention this conversation to anyone. No, I said. I wouldn't mind, but my father would consider my revelation the most extreme reason. You're free of him now. I'm still his prisoner. You have been freed, don't you understand? I've still my battle. He seemed near tears. I won't, I said. No one would believe me. I can't myself. There must be some mistake. There must be. I opened the door. Look, fellow, he said. This evening I am having a party at the Calamus. Would you like to join my guests? It might help you, no, thank you, sir. I'll be all right. Perhaps you'd like to be my valet? I looked at him. No, thank you. Sir, I said. Please, he said. I really want to help. Look, I happen to know of a possible job at Liberty Paints. My father has sent several fellows there. You should try, I shut the door. The elevator dropped me like a shot and I went out and walked along the street. The sun was very bright now and the people along the walk seemed far away. I stopped before a grey wall where high above me the headstones of a church graveyard arose like the tops of buildings. Across the street in the shade of an awning a shoeshine boy was dancing for pennies. I went on to the corner and got on a bus and went automatically to the rear. In the seat in front of me a dark man in a Panama hat kept whistling a tune between his teeth. My mind, flew in circles, to Bledsoe, Emerson and back again. There was no sense to be made of it. It was a joke. Hell, it couldn't be a joke. Yes, it is a joke. Suddenly the bus jerked to a stop and I heard myself humming the same tune that the man ahead was whistling, and the words came back, Oh well they picked poor Robin clean oh well they picked poor Robin clean well they tied poor Robin to a stump plod, they picked all the feathers round from Robin's rump well they picked poor Robin clean. Then I was on my feet. Hurrying to the door, hearing the thin, tissue paper against the teeth of a comb whistle following me outside at the next stop. I stood trembling at the curb, watching and half expecting to see the man leap from the door to follow me, whistling the old forgotten jingle about a bare rump robin. My mind seized upon the tune. I took the subway and it still droned through my mind after I had reached my room at men's house and lay across the bed. What was the who what when why where of poor old Robin? What had he done and who had tied him and why had they plucked him and why had we sung of his fate? It was for a laugh, for a laugh, all the kids had laughed and laughed, and the droll tuba player of the old Elks band had rendered it solo on his helical horn, with comical flourishes and doleful phrasing, boo 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 oo oo, poor Robin clean, a mock funeral dirge. But who was Robin and for what had he been hurt and humiliated? Suddenly I lay shaking with anger. It was no good. I thought of young Emerson. What if he'd lied out of some ulterior motive of his own? Everyone seemed to have some plan for me, and beneath that some more secret plan. What was young Emerson's plan, and why should it have included me? Who was I anyway? I tossed fitfully. Perhaps it was a test of my goodwill and faith. But that's a lie, I thought. It's a lie and you know it's a lie. I had seen the letter and it had practically ordered me killed. By slow degrees. 
My dear Mr. Emerson, I said aloud. The robin bearing this letter is a former student. Please hope him to death, and keep him running. Your most humble and obedient servant, A. H. Bledsoe. Sure, that's the way it was, I thought, a short, concise verbal coup de grace, straight to the nape of the neck. And Emerson would write in reply. Sure, dear Bled, have met Robin and Shave Tail. Signed, Emerson. I sat on the bed and laughed. They'd sent me to the rookery, all right. I laughed and felt numb and weak, knowing that soon the pain would come and that no matter what happened to me I'd never be the same. I felt numb and I was laughing. When I stopped, gasping for breath, I decided that I would go back and kill Bledsoe. Yes, I thought, I owe it to the race and to myself. I'll kill him. And the boldness of the idea and the anger behind it made me move with decision. I had to have a job and I took what I hoped was the quickest means. I called the plant young Emerson had mentioned, and it worked. I was told to report the following morning. It happened so quickly and with such ease that for a moment I felt turned around. Had they planned it this way? But no, they wouldn't catch me again. This time I had made the move. I could hardly get to sleep for dreaming of revenge.